Diane Nalini is an incredibly nuanced jazz singer and composer. She performs in four languages and teaches jazz ukulele as well. I hope you'll join me in my fascination with the incredible range of Diane's interests and expertise. Besides being a phenomenal musician, she's also a Rhodes Scholar with a PhD in Applied Physics from Oxford University and presently works in environmental science policy for the Canadian government. Not only is she a great lyricist, but she's also written songs inspired by great literature, including Shakespeare, in jazz, blues, gospel, folk, and bossa nova styles. During this conversation, she performed some of her original songs for us, and I've added timestamps in the description of the episode for the many interesting topics we touched on, as well as her incredible performances. Hi, Diane Nalini. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Leah. It's so nice to meet you over the internet like this. Thanks for having me. Well, I remember the first time I heard you was live pre-pandemic. I didn't introduce myself or anything, but our mutual friend, Roddy Elias, who was oh, on right. season one, I think he called me and he said, I'm playing with this amazing singer. She oh. does these songs based on Shakespeare. At, and it was at the Lori Elgin. And I, you know, I was sitting there with my husband and my eyes were so big. I couldn't believe what an amazing singer you were, performer. And the songs with Shakespeare's poetry, it was so moving and oh, surprising. Thank you. Wow, thanks for coming out to hear us. Well, that was such a delight to play with Roddy. He's such a star and he's he was so game to try anything, including like just throwing in some original tunes, throw some original tunes at him at the last minute. Um, I'm so glad you enjoyed the Shakespeare project. I must say that even though I recorded that some years ago now, that's still one of my favorite albums because it's the only album I've recorded where 100% of the compositions were my own. And um, it's pretty amazing to have a collaborator like Shakespeare, even though you know he's long dead, of course, but I felt like I had this amazing co-composer, co co-writer. <laughs> For those songs um yeah that was an album called songs of sweet fire and um it took me a long time to finish that project because um i remember i i started i i lived in england for a number of years and i started writing those pieces when i was i was part of a collective of uh, composers that we uh, mostly jazz musicians and we were setting poetry to music and and i had set a couple of Shakespeare pieces to music and a couple of poems by uh, Federico Garcia Lorca and um, one piece by um, Christina Rossetti. And we did them all in this concert. And, you know, it was interesting because some of the, I felt some of the pieces worked better than others. And I was working with a fixed instrumentation, which was just dictated by whoever was in this ensemble. And it's, it's always interesting. I love, um, I find constraints really interesting from a creative point of view when you're sort of like, okay, this is what you're working with. And so you, you work with whatever you're given and then you make something happen. And in that context, it just turned out that the Shakespeare pieces worked really, like really spoke to me. And, um, and so it sort of started me on this journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you strike me, the more I, I learned about you and I, I'm such a big fan. I love all your albums. Oh, thank you. And I, um, I knew you were a Rhodes Scholar and, you know, a physicist and you've done this stuff. <laughs> but then I learned that you studied and, and created um, Chinese calligraphy and watercolors for many years. Yes, yes. That was something, you know, when you're a kid, you don't want to be left out of anything your parents are doing. And my parents had studied Chinese watercolor painting and calligraphy for some years before I was born. Mm. And then when I was old enough, they, they would bring me when I was a little kid they would just bring me sometimes to their classes because you know they didn't have a babysitter and I would just be in the corner doodling on my own and at some point I decided I was like I want to try this too and the the teacher kept saying no I don't teach children and she refused to teach me and then finally I hit the age of 10 and I think I was less wiggly and less <laughs> less rambunctious and she finally thought I was settled down enough that she could tolerate having me in the <laughs> in the classroom and she basically said I'm going to sit her down at this table any funny business or if she misbehaves she's out <laughs> so I was like on my best behavior because I wanted to stick around and yeah I loved um I loved uh, studying with her her name was v Virginia Chang and um and it would be two hours or two and a half hours a week every Saturday morning and you know there's something so contemplative and um when do I find that doing calligraphy is almost like a meditation 
and it focuses your efforts and it, it's it's interesting because um and I and I think that music is the same way I don't know if you feel the same way about your journey uh, in sort of uh, in mastering your, your your instrument but progress is not linear in at least it wasn't for me I would plateau and plat and I would hit I would be at a plateau for literally years and I'd be like kind of frustrated you know I'm working so hard on this calligraphy and these watercolors and nothing is changing and then all of a sudden it, it was like then one some something would change you'd go back the next week and all of a sudden you'd made what it felt like a, a leap in abilities but in fact it's not really a big leap it's I think there's a latency it's all being percolating in the background <laughs> but it just mm -hmm. feels like a leap and then you plateau for, for a longer a little while longer so it's interesting it's very non-linear and and I feel like and same same thing with musical instruments I think um, I feel like that might be one of the reasons people get discouraged and give up is because they don't see a gradual progression of they don't always see that gradual improvement and they don't stick it out long enough to suddenly see that kind of quantized leap in improvement and if only one can have faith in the fact that that will happen with enough elbow grease um, I think if we could all have that faith, then we would stick it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I um, I, I that brings me to so many things I want to talk to you about. But before we leave the calligraphy thing, it just jogged my memory. I was in China once, and I, one of my strongest memories of that time was this old man who had one of those giant, giant brushes that was like six feet tall and yes. water. And it was a very hot day and he was just doing the calligraphy and using his whole body and then it would just evaporate and it was such a beautiful thing to watch oh that's so beautiful and and that that's one of the things i love about the other thing i love about calligraphy and i've only come to see the linkages uh some years later after i stopped doing calligraphy but what what you always learn when you're doing either chinese watercolor painting or calligraphy is that there are no do-overs it's not mm -hmm. like oil painting where you can build layers every single stroke you commit to your rice paper or your silk or whatever you're painting on is there forever and every mistake is visible and you can't cover things up and um and and you know i think it was bill evans who wrote about calligraphy in the liner notes for the album kind of blue about the analogy between jazz and uh, calligraphy saying that you know just like calligraphy with with improvisational music you record it it's spontaneous whatever you commit to tape is there forever and particularly in an era where albums were not overdubbed and there was no kind of multi-tracking overdues or do-overs or splices or whatever everything that you play in the moment is committed to the medium and and, and so in that sense it hadn't occurred to me that these two passions that i grew up with two of the passions i grew up with jazz and and calligraphy had that in common that idea of spontaneous creation and risk taking <laughs> yeah. yeah and you created paintings for that shakespeare album as well i did i did i had not i hadn't necessarily intended to do that i didn't set out to do that when i finished recording that album i had a humongous amount of like just volumes of stuff to listen to because there were 15 songs on the project 15 pieces of, mu of Shakespeare's poetry or songs from the plays that I had uh, set to music and you know that means even if you just do two or three takes of each tune and that's basically what we did I didn't have a lot of studio time and my musicians were excellent so I didn't need to do zillions of takes thankfully but even so two three takes times 15 you're looking at like 45 takes to listen to and sometimes in the studio you feel it in the moment when it's the take, you know, like if you, it's almost like you get the um, la chair de poule, you get um, chicken, uh, no, not chicken skin, goosebumps, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get goosebumps because you feel it. You're like, oh my God, everybody's playing so great. This is the take. And so usually like as a producer, I'm performing, but I'm also trying to keep notes of, you know, did anyone make a mistake? Do we need to redo anything? So in the moment, as you're recording, you're listening to your own performance, but you're listening to everybody's performance and you're listening to the energy on the take and, and, and making notes. So I try to keep good notes when we're in the studio and I'll circle whichever take I think was the one, I'll circle it, my visceral reaction to whatever I'm hearing in the studio. But for some of them, I had no particular like visceral feeling and I was like, oh, I'll have to figure that out later. So. As I was listening to, I, I traveled to England to visit some friends and I stayed there for like five weeks and I was staying in, in the flat of some, of some friends of mine and that flat did not have a television or anything like 
and I didn't I don't think I even had a radio this was way before the era of like iPads and, <laughs> and internet radio and all that and so to keep myself company while I listened to all these takes I started sketching and drawing and doing watercolors and and I didn't quite realize that each of the songs was like triggering like t stuff in me like so I was just painting what what the songs were evoking for me and and then I suddenly realized I was like oh I have a I guess I have now I now have this collection of watercolors that sort of correspond to each of the songs and so that became the booklet with the lyrics so that's the uh, the most expensive album I've ever produced because it had like this 20 page booklet or something <laughs> But it was fun. It was like a multi, it felt a bit like a multimedia project for me because I had d done everything like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the songwriting and then the, the, con the work of designing the booklet and designing the cover and everything. Mm -hmm. And so when um, you were growing up and doing watercolors and listening to jazz and singing, you were dancing. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I think I was one of these kids who just can't make up their minds of what they want to do. And, um, Strangely enough, even though music was always a part of my life, ever since I was a kid, I think my mom said I basically started to sing and talk at the same time. And I started to sing jazz when I was like three. So singing what came around the age of two and then the jazz came at three. I always just did that. Like singing was just something, it sort of came kind of effortlessly to me. I think I was lucky my mom had a very strong sense of pitch. She never sang out of tune and my dad just loved jazz. So kind of, you know, put them together and I just... I grew up listening along like to Ella and Sarah, but it, it never really, it, until I was a bit older, it never, it never occurred to me that I might want to become a jazz singer. But what did occur to me, like I have one of those books when I was a kid where you write down in the first grade all the things you dream of being when you grow up. And it was ballet dancer, astronomer, archeologist, and I can't remember what the other one was. But I didn't see as, tip, you know, with with kids, kids don't see limitations. They don't think, hmm, I can't do all those things. So you just have big dreams and you think, I want to do all these things. Um, and ballet, yeah, I didn't love it my first year studying it. I enrolled in, in ballet. I think I asked my mom if I could take ballet lessons when I was five or six. And I also was studying piano with a nun at the school where my mom taught. Um, and she was a very nice lady, very nice nun. But she was very strict and she wanted me to follow <laughs> the piano curriculum and she wanted me to read the notes and I um, I was not good at I was not paying attention to that I would learn stuff by ear and then I would just look at the keys and remember where the notes were and what I wanted to hear and she'd like stop looking at the keys and look at your page and learn to read your notes and I was like ah and then I wanted to syncopate everything so <laughs> My dad, my dad says he remembers me when she left the room at one point to go to the bathroom. I said, oh, come in here. And I started like jazzing up Papa Haydn and stuff, stuff like that. And so she was not impressed with me. I was like a, a sort of um, like an unruly student, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I, uh, I gave up piano in favor of ballet and studied that for the next, pretty intensely for the next 11 years. And I wanted to be a dancer and I was like, you know, every year I would do more hours per week. And, and of course, dance is so wonderful because it's music, it's, you know, it's, it's your body is, in, in you are literally embodying the music, right? And so if you love music, you get to move to it and it's, it's just, it's glorious. Um, and at, at one point I was doing like 20 hours a week, which, was, which is a lot when you're also in school and high school and stuff. So it was like three hours a night plus on weekends, like six hours a day on a Saturday or something like that. As when we had shows, we would do these annual shows at the Place des Arts in Montreal as a, as, a, as a company. We were not a professional company or anything, but she, our choreographer had professional dancers that she'd hire into the company. And then I was lucky enough to sort of get to do some solo pieces or be a soloist in some of her choreographies. And then one year I auditioned to the National Ballet School's summer program and I got in and I went to Toronto and it was kind of draconian like you get there and they wouldn't let you call home for the first two weeks mm. because they wanted to see if you could handle living away from your parents and I was very much like very close to my parents and um, so that I was miserable like from the get-go because I wasn't allowed to call home and everybody was everyone there is either like anorexic or bulimic or both yeah. you know and it's just it's not a healthy lifestyle and I didn't 
I didn't want to end up that way and I could feel the pressure to lose more weight and mm. plus you know my knees I had problems with my knees and I had chronic tendonitis in my Achilles tendon on my right foot and I just thought oh, I'm gonna be one of those people who's constantly struggling with injuries and it's just gonna get worse as I get older plus I, I did love sciences and I enjoyed them and it was pretty clear to me that if I wanted to be a dancer, I'd have to give up on going to CJEP in university and mm -hmm. I'd just have to just do dance the, full, the whole time. So it's funny because it was the very next year after I kind of quit dance cold to Turkey for a little while because um, I couldn't stand to see myself go down. Like I couldn't stand to see mm -hmm. that. I was like, last year I could do triple pirouettes and now I you know you think your, your leg's up there when you're doing it 20 hours a week and then if you oh, go back to doing it twice a week or something, like you can't lift, you can't just, you just can't do the things you used mm -hmm. to do because you're not at peak level, right? And then I quit. I went to Dawson College for CJEP and that very year I met um, um, a bassist who became my boyfriend at the time um and and we started doing gigs together professionally and it was it was amazing because it was as if dance had left my life and it had left this big gaping hole of artistic yearning in my life and just very fortuitously i started i met some jazz musicians and i started to sing jazz like professionally like from a pretty young age and i was it, it really filled this this need in my life the, the big gap that had been left by dance and it was just felt like so much fun because it's something I had been doing since I was a kid and I had sung in church and I had you know sung some solo solo stuff in choirs and stuff but it was not the music that I grew up most passionate about so being able to perform it when I was uh, in CJEP and university was like a big thrill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And in terms of mentors, like you met a science mentor in Dawson College, right? Yes, I had, you know, I had many science mentors. Um, I, I had a wonderful uh, physics teacher by the name of Richard Shoemaker, mm -hmm. who really opened my eyes to the beauty of physics. I had a wonderful chemistry teacher called um, uh, Mr. John Mohammed, and together, um, it was just so inspiring to be in their classes because they followed the logical thread of things and I feel like some of the ways of thinking about science that I still have to this day are due to those people who basically were always wanting to derive everything from first principles and avoiding memorizing too much because you could always arrive at things from first principles so I really I, I feel like I owe a lot to them mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing so you I, I'm trying to, I know you have your ukulele and you're going to, uh, you've been prepared to sing for us. Do you want to oh, yeah. have a little music break or do you want to do absolutely. that later? Absolutely. No, happy to do yeah. that. Absolutely. Um, so, um, so this is a, um, a baritone ukulele, which means it's, tu it's tuned D, G, B, E, like the top uh, four strings of a, a guitar, actually. And uh, I thought I would uh, play uh, you something, since we've been talking about physics, um, I thought I would play you something from my fourth album um which was called kiss me like that and i was gonna ask you about the song <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah. sure yeah oh sorry please go ahead <laughs> oh no just that i knew that you're i'm sure you're gonna say exactly what i was gonna ask you in terms oh, of sure. okay. yeah yeah um so this is a song called winter eclipse and i wrote it uh on a after a really cool but actually very cold experience of staying up late to watch a lunar eclipse uh with a friend and uh, this was, I think this was a lunar eclipse in February of 2008, I think it was. And, um, and he kept making us hot toddies, going inside and making us hot toddies to keep us warm. And um, yeah, I'll do this song for you now. Maybe I'll explain the ending after I finish it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> The moon is peeking through the treetops. She paints blue patterns on the ground. Knee deep in a snowdrift, I wait up while you pass hot toddies around, round. Honey and whiskey and lime, passing the time, passing the time. 
You've planted lawn chairs in the snowbank. We balance gingerly in place. The night holds the promise of romance. Just us in the vastness of space, space. Twinkling stars in their grace. Spinning through space, spinning through space. I know it's exciting to stay up. Apart from the cold, it's bliss. We don't want to miss this winter eclipse. But really, I must insist on blankets. At last, Earth's shadow seems to sneak up. The moon, she bathes in amber light. Mid-pour, you stop talking and look up. You're right, it's a marvelous sight. Bright light from the rusty red glow softens the snow, softens the snow. I know it's exciting to stay up. Apart from the cold, it's bliss. We don't want to miss this winter eclipse, but really I must insist on blankets. At last, Earth's shadow seems to sneak up. The moon, she bathes in amber light. Mid pour, you stop talking and look up. You're right, it's a marvelous sight. Bright light from the neighbors next door. Turn off the light, turn off the light. Turn off the light. Beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so that that was like a the the ending of that song is actually something that happened to us where, you know, we've been watching in the dark for what felt like hours, um, because lunar eclipses take a long time to happen. And uh and we've been watching and your eyes get adapted to the dark and you're seeing like all the stars and the beautiful rusty dimmed moon and then somebody turned on their porch light and we were like ah! <laughs> totally blinded so what's really funny is um i was contacted um you know it, it, i i was contacted by someone from the dark sky society who asked whether they could use that song as kind of like a something like an emblematic thing of like to 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 <laughs> advertise the needs for respecting the dark skies for astronomy i was like yeah go for it <laughs> was i was i was also thinking of your song um that you wrote as a mnemonic for the order of stars kiss me like oh, yes how's it? kiss me yeah. like that yeah that's right yes yeah it, it um you know it's funny because i was teaching an astronomy class at university of guelph and um it, they they use um it's it's a very kind of random order of stars on when when stars go through life on something called the main sequence uh, it basically the main sequence is basically a sort of a, a rule that helps you organize stars into categories where provided that they're still fusing uh, hydrogen into helium in their cores this is a part of their life cycle that's kind of predictable and basically, if a, if a sun is very, very massive, it's going to be very hot and it's going to have a surface that's more like bluish and it's going to be what's called an O-type star. And um, if a, a star is um, like OB, a fine girl, kiss me, the M-class stars at the other end of that alphabetical mnemonic, they're going to be the smaller stars that are going to be redder and dimmer and less bright. And so the, this mnemonic is something that all astronomy students learn. It's just a way of trying to keep track of which type of designation to give stars in order from very hot, which is the O-type star, 
to very, very cool, which is the M-type star. And that mnemonic has existed since Victorian times. But more recently, thanks to more powerful telescopes, they discovered two other extensions to that classification system. And those are the L-type stars and the T-type stars, which are even dimmer and are very hard to see, which is why they were only discovered more recently with more powerful telescopes. And so I thought, okay, we need to expand the mnemonic. And I thought, okay, well, I want, this, I want this to be a bit of an, a feminist empowering song. So it's going to be a lady who's saying, um, be a fine girl, kiss me like that. Tell me, tell, tell me how you want to be kissed. And it can be, be a fine guy, kiss me like mm. that. <laughs> it can be either. It's gender neutral. <laughs> but yeah, so I thought I'd write a song to, to play for my students that would, would help them to remember um, remember things. I think that song in particular, it didn't start life out necessarily as a song. I, I think I started writing an angsty kind of poem about a breakup. <laughs> <laughs> and so that song is a bit of an allegory for uh, a relationship that's gone bad. And it starts out really hot, like, uh, like the early universe, and then it cools out and starts expanding and cooling, like, <laughs> like the Big Bang. Everything gets cooled after the Big Bang. <laughs> Your your students must have been upset when you decided to leave academia and Aww. work for, like you did climate um, ad advising for the government, right, on climate yes, change? Yes, I, I actually, I still work in Environment Climate Change Canada now. Mm -hmm. I've done a few, I've moved around departments quite a bit. I started my, my career in the federal government in Environment Climate Change Canada. Then I moved around a, a few places and now I've come back to that department because I feel like, although I enjoyed the other positions, that this place, this work is really kind of I think my heart is the most passionate about this and I just love the work so um, it's where I feel like my background in science is the most useful even though I'm not actually doing scientific research anymore I'm doing giving developing advice and, and recommendation you know like you're, you're supporting policies and Canada's negotiations in different places but it's all always needs to be grounded in evidence and science and so I very much enjoy the challenge of trying to translate a bunch of very technical stuff into plain language so that it's understandable to anybody, uh, you know, because politicians, ministers, they don't all have a science background. They're smart people, though, and you need to be able to express yourself clearly to anybody, no matter what their own background might be. And it's, it's not always easy for everybody to do that, to let go of their technical background and to synthesize something and bring it down to its core ideas. So that's a really interesting challenge, and it appeals to, I think, you know, there's a there's a thread through everything I've done in life, and it's, pr I know it's pr probably this combination of education and creativity. If I, if I have to try to find the commonalities between everything that I've done, it's, it, it's learning, uh, to me, and I, a, a life worth living is one where you're always learning new things, and you're challenging yourself, and you're trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> so if you can do all those things at once, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as you're somehow guided by those principles. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's in your future perfect album that you have that song I love. Uh, I think the big hurrah or the oh the last hurrah. The last hurrah, yeah. Oh yes. Oh my goodness, that is definitely inspired by my my angst over climate change. Yeah, I gotta say, like <laughs> you probably can hear it in the lyrics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I started writing that song way back when like way before I um, even became a professor at University of Guelph I was teaching at a CJEP in Montreal I won't say which one <laughs> but um, it was a it was a very nice place to be don't get me wrong but there were a lot of wealthy kids who went to this school and you know they'd get dropped off by parents driving SUVs there's only one person in the whole car and you're just like why do they need such a huge gas guzzling vehicle <laughs> right and what I saw firsthand in that college was that struggle between ideological kids who want to do something different with their lives and what their parents want for them and 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 how you know everybody at some point grows up and is always afraid of becoming their parents and you know sometimes sometimes people skew away from that trend and sometimes they go for it like at some point everybody makes a, a decision whether they're going to flip in that direction or not and um, I just I saw that t tension between the young kid who's the idealistic activist and the parent who 
you know, understandably wants some kind of security for their kid and they're like, no, you know, I've paid all this money for your education. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a, a dentist or whatever, whatever career it's going to be. But at the end of the day, um, my concern is that if nothing changes in our society and we're still driven by materialism and the acquisition of more things and a kind of disregard for the impact that our lives has on have on the planet then we're doomed like we have to learn to live more lightly to tread more lightly on the planet mm -hmm. right and that's the challenge that i feel excited that I feel both excited and scared because I feel excited that uh, on the one hand climate change is at the forefront of people's minds and it's in the news all the time and that's great but on the other hand is it's 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 uh, the debate is the jury's still out on whether we're doing enough I think most of the most of the you know we just had the IPCC report coming out last week that said we're not doing enough and we're not going to manage to we keep warming down unless we do much 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 more and then uh, the challenge is to me the interesting challenge is at the the individual level there's a lot of stuff we can do where we don't have to rely and wait for industry or government to do stuff but the things we need to do as individuals are hard like i was reading the article an article in the guardian that said there's like six things that everybody can do right now regardless of what's going on at a higher level but it involves things like, you know, not traveling more than once every three years, not taking a, a domestic airplane within Canada only once every three years, and the w only one transatlantic flight every eight years. Can mm. you imagine, like us as musicians, how do we make a living if you need to tour or you need to travel to teach or to perform? How do you do that in a climate conscious way? Clearly, it's not feasible under the current way things work right so right away you take more than one flight every eight years and you're breaking that rule <laughs> it's it's really interesting like the challenges we're going to face in the next 10 or 20 years it's, it's going to be interesting mm. yeah of, of that list what did you think were the most important things well one of the things that i find easiest to do but that's just me i'm not trying to mm. proselytize or anything but of the six things the thing that is easiest for me to do is to convert to a mostly plant-based diet so mm -hmm. like because eating meat is not only like to me there's a lot of reasons to to worry about the impacts of eating meat one is if you're eating factory farmed food then the animals are living under very horrible circumstances and they have painful lives and painful deaths but also meat is like highly emitting of ghgs like methane especially and so if you cutting out meat is both better for the climate and better for the animals so to me that was like the no-brainer but I've already done that like one of the things I've been trying to do I've been vegetarian mostly vegetarian for many years I say mostly because occasionally I'll have like a tiny little bit of fish if there's no other choice and I there's nothing else to eat and I have no choice but the challenge for me has been to cut out the dairy and the cheese because <laughs> I I've always loved cheese but I'm trying to eat mostly like vegan food and almost c cutting dairy out entirely um, but you know I, I try not to be too like militaristic about anything so if, if somebody tells me this is a farmer that I know and they're happy their hens are happy I'm like okay I'm gonna eat an egg I don't need to freak out about that it's a happy hen it's an egg I could do that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. you know so I think we have to be we have to be um, patient with each other and kind to each other and understanding of each other of what everybody's capable of doing in a, any given moment. But the other thing they said in that list that was interesting was um, trying not to buy more than three articles of clothing per year. And I don't know if that includes things like socks and underwear, <laughs> like the <laughs> real basics, but I was like, oh my God, like that's another thing that's, I don't buy a lot of clothes, but I'm pretty sure I've bought more than three articles of clothing this year, right? And um, and that's because the and in, in the pandemic, I bought almost nothing, but pre-pandemic, for sure, I was like, also as a performer, um, it might be different if you're in an orchestra, because you guys are lucky, lucky that you can wear black all the time, but I find as a performer, I also feel like I need to have a certain renewal of the wardrobe like you know if you wear the same dress to <laughs> especially now with YouTube it's like oh she's wearing the same dress and we saw her in that two years ago or whatever right so you do have to sort of 
but I do try to give stuff away. Like I'm not throwing the clothing out or anything, but I do try to s to sort of rotate things out. But basically, I think we all have to get vintage. <laughs> I guess is what the what the article is saying. Try to buy like secondhand clothes and stuff. <laughs> So, uh, ukulele, you, it, I guess I've always pronounced it wrong, so it's ukulele? Rather oh, than ukulele. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 again, I think there are multiple ways of pronouncing it, but in Hawaii, they call it ukulele, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you have a pretty new channel, ukulele for jazz singers? Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right, it is new, yes. Um, yeah, it's, I started it in 2019, I think, I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> And you're doing some online, I mean, people will listen to this at various times, but if they're listening to it when this comes out, you're doing some um, workshops with actually people in Hawaii as well, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I um, I started the channel Ukulele for Jazz Singers because I, um, I had a, a number of voice students who um, don't play an instrument. And, and that seems to be, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's almost like a mental, like a psychological hurdle for them to um it, to to kind of approach a piano and so um what i what i was trying i tried I, my point in starting that channel was to be like okay if you want to sing jazz you got to play if you got to play some instrument just so that you have a chordal basis to not just not necessarily to accompany yourself for an actual performance but when you're trying to work out chord charts and write arrangements for yourself you need to you need to know how to how to do that and mm -hmm. um, and there's also a lot of gobbledygook out there in the published world like some some published sheet music for jazz songs is good and sometimes it's rubbish and or there's mistakes and so you need to be able to figure out for yourself if the chord chart is correct or not right and uh, what I noticed is there are some some singers who will like pay a pianist to write all the charts for them or they will pay someone else to help them with their arrangements and I just wanted to do something that would start to empower people to to take those steps uh, to learn an instrument and the the ukulele is so wonderful because it's um it's not intimidating you know you got four fingers available and four strings it's like it's almost like it was meant to be you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's it's a very joyful instrument it's small like i call it my goldilocks instrument because about 10 years ago i i studied um guitar you know I was trying to learn the nylon string guitar because I love bossa nova and so again I was trying to figure stuff out a lot by ear for myself and um and while I love the guitar it's just a little too big for me and I was finding my wrist was kind of hurting just I know that's no excuse I feel really bad saying things like that because you see those little North Korean girls who are like five years old and they're playing huge full-sized guitars in these little ensembles of little and you think hey, if a five-year-old can do it I should be I should not complain but anyway this guy is just the right size for mm -hmm. me and um, and so yeah it's it also the channel also delves a little bit into some very basic uh, jazz music jazz theory just so that people I again whenever I teach workshops I try to throw in some just very basic theory it's not like it's not again not intimidating but just trying to explain to people this is a 251 this is a major 251 a minor 251 a 1625 like the can't the kind of progressions that they're going to see over and over and over in jazz standards just so that they can start to to recognize those mm -hmm. and um the, the the workshops that i do online are sometimes i give zoom workshops and those are more intimate so i might have like 20 30 people and people can ask questions and we can all see each other which is great and then other times I do live stream workshops over YouTube and what's fun about that is I make them free so that um, anybody can join you know if they can't afford to buy a handout they don't have to but then I also have handout how to handouts and and I put together usually like a booklet a resource booklet that will have like the history of the tune and maybe like 10 different recordings linked so that people can check out different recordings of the tune and um, and just some harmonic analysis and stuff like that so that if they want to enrichment enrich their experience they can get the booklet and have the chord charts and there's like backing tracks that I'll give them and everything and that's been really rewarding because that's something that I only started doing during the pandemic and uh, out of necessity because um, everything was cancelled all our concerts were cancelled and my workshops that I had planned to give in person were cancelled and I had been booked to teach this was in 2020 I had a whole bunch of um, work sh of, of festivals that I was going to teach in, mostly in the U.S. The U.S. has a lot more ukulele festivals than we do here in Canada. Um, 
and uh, luckily I hadn't quite yet gotten to the stage of paying for my work permit for the U.S. Mm -hmm. because those are expensive and they're not refundable (laughs) regardless of a pandemic or not. So I hadn't quite gotten there, but still like everything was canceled. And I thought, okay, maybe I can do something online. And it's been amazing teaching these workshops online because I've had people participating and tuning in that I would never have expected, like people in Germany and Italy and the UK and Australia and all over the U.S. and all over Canada. And just to be able to connect with those people and find these people who have a common desire to learn more and to share music, it's been amazing. And it's very heartwarming to see the comment, like people in the chat will be saying things like, you know, this has really brightened my day or thank you for, you know, bringing this song and this music into our lives during this difficult time. And it was the same feeling we got when Adrian, my husband and I started live streaming. We, s- we did a series of... Um, concerts <coughs> excuse me of free concerts at the beginning of the pandemic again just to try to bring some happiness into people's lives and people would write down they'd be like this is great you know there's no live music happening in Ottawa right now so we really look forward to your Saturday concerts and again it was like building this community of people who just needed that um that injection of joy in their lives and what we did during that concert series was um We always ended each live stream with a sing-along song (laughs) because I really, I really believe that making music together, even if you're just singing along to your TV, watching a a live stream, you know, it it, it releases the oxytocin in the brain. It makes us, it really has a chemical, proven chemical effect. Music has a proven effect to, to make us feel joy and love, you know? So during the pandemic, I think it was really more important than ever to have that. Yeah, so I want to get, um, we should need to talk about Sync Space uh, oh, Live. Yes. <laughs> but before we get to that, I just, because you mentioned Bossa Nova and your Bossa Nova singing is so beautiful. Um, now your mom was from Goa, so she spoke Portuguese. Like, did you learn it as a young person? or? Um, you know, so my mom's first language, yes, you're right, that she is from, she was born in Bombay, but her her siblings and my grandmother and her and her father and mother are, are, were born in Goa. And uh, she's from Goa, and it's the Portuguese part of, or what used to be the Portuguese part of India. And uh, and so my grandma's mother tongue was Portuguese. But interestingly, my grandma and grandfather always spoke to their kids in English because I think they thought that Portuguese would be like the language just between them so that they would Mm. have a way that they could speak to each other without the kids understanding. But the irony is that even though they never taught Portuguese formally to their kids, my mom figured it all out and so she could understand <laughs> i think my my grandparents thought that nobody could understand them but my mom was understanding everything so so yeah my 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 mom understands portuguese well doesn't speak it very much but understands everything and so but when i was a little girl i actually heard my grandma speaking portuguese and she would have little nicknames for for me like she called me amorzinha which means little love <laughs> in portuguese and she would always have like little sayings uh, and that, that she would say in Portuguese, but we all sort of understood what she meant. Like her favorite saying was barca parada não faz viagem, which means like um, an anchored boat or a, a stopped boat doesn't make any trips, <laughs> which I'm probably loose. That's just a loose translation. But that was her like she would that was her motto when she felt we needed to get up and go and do things, you know, like don't don't stay idle. <laughs> go out there and do things um but yeah she so she she spoke portuguese and i learned a little bit from her but i really um only got to learn portuguese like formally um when i moved to england um Hmm. and until then i had started to sing at a i had a regular gig with um, a wonderful jazz pianist from um montreal i was in montreal at the time uh, by the name of Pierre Le Duc, and Pierre was f- amazing. Like he, so, he was like on the faculty at University of Montreal jazz department, and he had these really amazing musicians with him: Daniel Le Sart on the bass, and um, Pierre Belus on the drums. And I met a future collaborator, lifelong collaborator of mine, called Danny Roy, who was a at the time a very young, amazing tenor saxophonist. And into this quartet, I got invited 
I don't even remember. I, Danny was the one who invited me to sub for him sometimes. When he couldn't do the gig, he would ask me to sub for him, and I would go in there and, and sing. And then I think Danny went on tour or something one summer, and so I got hired as a, his kind of replacement for the whole summer. So I was gigging there two nights a week, Fridays and Saturdays, with this amazing jazz quartet. Like Pierre Le Duc was the guy that Miles Davis called when Miles was in town, and Pierre would accompany Miles. So he was that caliber of amazing musician, right? And Pierre told me one day we were playing in this jazz bar, jazz club, jazz bar that was in the uh, ground floor of a hotel in Montreal. The, the place was called Puzzles. And they had a lot of traveling people coming in and out, and in, including a big Brazilian contingent, like Brazilian business people and tourists would come and stay there. And I remember one time Pierre said to me, okay, let's do some bossa nova. What bossa nova songs do you know? And I was like, I knew Girl from Ipanema, but I knew it in English. And Pierre was like, that won't do. You've <laughs> got to learn some, Bra some Brazilian tunes. We've got all these Brazilians here. So I was like, oh my God. So. I, you know, I studied really hard for the week, the following week after that very first time playing with him. I got myself as many albums as I could. I dug out some Chico Buarque that my uncle, I have an uncle who lives in Brazil. And, uh, and he had sent me some albums when I was little. So I dug out my Chico Buarque. I dug out my Jobim. I dug out, you know, everything that I could find of uh, Juan Gilberto, Astro Gilberto, you know. And I started learning these tunes. Um, but I was... I was singing them through the guy. The accent that I had at the time was something inherited from my mom, and it was a, luckily I was okay speaking like Latin languages generally because you know I went, I spoke, f I grew up speaking English and French. I went to French school all, all my life, but I also studied about five years of Spanish in the same school that I'd been at, and we studied it at a pretty rigorous level. Like we were, we had very strict grammarians <laughs> teaching mm. us, so it was great because. The grammar of Portuguese is not dissimilar at all to the grammar of, of, uh, of Spanish and French. And so combined, I could kind of fake my way through. But I didn't get to really dive into and understand the subtleties of Brazilian Portuguese until I shared a home with a Brazilian teach a teacher of Portuguese from Brazil when mm. I was in Oxford in England. She was my house, my, f my good friend, and then she, we became housemates, and I took private lessons with her, and it was awesome, because that, and I got to practice with her and her friends, and so I met a whole ton of Brazilians in Oxford, and so that was really what helped me to, and now, you know, all these years later, I'm a, I still love to sing in Brazilian Portuguese, but I would love to get more practice speaking it on a regular basis, like I used to. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, Sing Space, we mentioned briefly, your husband, Adrian Cho, started this amazing platform and company. Yes. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking about it. Yeah, so Sing Space was something that Adrian came up with um, during the pandemic because we tried a bunch of commercially available software that is supposed to allow you to jam over the internet with other musicians, and we were not happy with any of it. Like the video was wildly out of sync with the audio and it was not something that you could really ever use to perform in time over the internet. But Adrian has a very strong background in tech. Um, he used to, you know, he's worked for IBM and Shopify and all these other places. And so, and he's a musician himself and he is the director of the Ottawa Jazz Orchestra. And because for those first few months I was mentioning, we started live streaming together, just the two of us from our living rooms, um, from our living room, from like April until June, ev for 12 weeks, we did a, a show every week. And we learned so much about live streaming, uh, about the do's and don'ts of, of, of trying to live stream with high qual good quality, you know, video and audio and everything. So he was able to put together all those different diverse experiences and really dive deep into like what needs to be done in order to have the best possible experience and the lowest latency. And the low latency is key because as you know, um, you know, the way that musicians play in time together is to listen to each other. And that's how we manage to stay synchronized. And what you, you don't want anything longer than like, let's say, I'd, I'd say the upper limit that we can tolerate is probably something like 20 milliseconds. Uh, or 25 milliseconds, which is sort of the equivalent of uh, uh, that delay in the signal would be, uh, uh, let's say, the equivalent of like a 50-foot round trip 
So it would be like being 25 feet away from your fellow musicians, mm. which is which is something classical musicians are used to. Like if you're on, in a big orchestra and you're on a big stage, I, I, know, I was thinking about that. Is it the Wagner? I can't remember what town it's in. There's like a Wagner festival where they have like a thousand people in the orchestra or something like that in Germany. I can't remember what town it's in. But to to perform in a huge space like that, where you're literally like the conductor does this and you hear a few milli, you know, a few milliseconds later, you're gonna hear the sound coming at you because you're so far away. Well, classical musicians are very good at negotiating all that because they have to do it all the time on these huge, in these, these big orchestras, right? Where if you're 50 feet away from your fellow musician, there's gonna be a delay between when they strike the bow on the violin and when you hear it, let's say. So in the same vein, I think professional musicians are good at dealing with a certain amount of latency. They can navigate that okay, and then you just have to have the confidence to jump in and go, okay, boom, that's the time, let's do it, <laughs> you know? Um, but what Adrian's managed to do is devise this platform that's where the video and the audio are in very good sync with each other. So from an audience perspective, it's, flaw it's seamless because the audience is seeing you know, the lips are moving and the sound's coming out correctly. They're not seeing crazy delays. But more importantly, the musicians are hearing each other almost instantaneously. And so they're able to perform. And SyncSpace launched um, in, I think it, we did a, a free concert for New Year's Eve of 2020. And it was, it made kind of a bit, of, you know, it made a bit of a splash because we had just entered lock another lockdown. There was a curfew that had just been announced in Quebec. And there was nothing to do. Everybody's New Year's Eve plans had to be canceled because of COVID, you know? And so we got a bunch of people. I think we had several hundred people joining for the live stream. And, uh, and, and Adrian had a tip jar going. And it was just, it was a joyful, joyful thing. And, uh, and, and then Adrian decided to launch SyncSpace as a platform, as a concert venue, as an online concert venue. And we got a wonderful, I helped him with the sound just that first time because it was a lot to do to do. He's mixing video and he's switching mm. between like, he, he, he'll listen for who's going to solo and he'll put the camera on them. Yeah. Like everybody, you know, he switches live on the fly. He's doing video editing, like on the fly. And again, his background as a musician helps him to predict, like he can, he can tell when someone's about to take a solo just based on the fact that, you know, the the dynamics of the tune might change and, and you know that that means the solo is about to end and someone else is going to take it. So he, he can really edit to the music in a way that I think someone who doesn't have that musical background might have done the edit a bit more randomly, whereas he'll always edit to the beat. So, you know, he'll edit at the end of the eighth measure of a 32 bar form or at the end of the 32 bar measure or whatever. So it's always very musical. All his editing is very kind of tasteful and musical. Um, and then I was just helping that first show. So I did the sound and he did all the video. But he has since then become very adept at doing both. <laughs> so unless it's a big band where it's like 11 or 12 musicians, then maybe I'll come and help him do the sound again just so he can focus more on the many, many people who are on video. But most of the time he's doing both on his own. And, and it's been great. A lot of musicians said that it was a lifeline for them because during the pandemic they didn't have any other work. So it was a way for them to keep their chops up um, they might have, of course, been teaching virtually as well during the pandemic, which is, you know, really more of a bread, more of where most people's bread and butter comes in. If they're both teaching and performing, I think most people are earning more from teaching than from performing these days. But um, what was so important to the musicians was to keep the joy and the passion of performing alive during the pandemic when all else had been canceled and, yeah. and nothing else was possible. So I watched him work so hard like literally 15 16 17 like 20 hour days sometimes trying to make it all happen because he's a one-man show he's doing it all himself you know so he develops the platform he hosts the concerts he attends people's rehearsals so that he can get some footage to cut into a one minute um mm -hmm. trailer for the concert and he is the one having to do the promotion for those concerts. And so he's doing everything, but it's it's been amazing to see how he's turned this into something really special and really unique. Um, and he's had classical musicians on the platform, jazz musicians. Um, there's this quartet of klezmer musicians, Quartetto Gelato. Um, and a French horn ensemble of like four French horns. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. I've never seen that before with just four French horns doing a concert together. 
but like world class amazing new york philharmonic french horn guys and you know like they're all world class but it's, it's like so what's interesting about sing space is you can have these very experimental combinations of musicians so for example um I think this is it this Friday or this Saturday they're going to have a concert with three pianists mm. like most venues wouldn't even have three pianos yeah. you know and they're going to it won't be three like traditional pianos I think one of them is Mark Ferguson's going to play like B3 organ mm -hmm. and uh, Peter Hum is going to play his Rhodes and then Mike Manny's going to play the actual piano so texture wise it they won't be stepping on each other's toes because they each have different sonorities but it's still pretty bizarre right to have three <laughs> keyboard players but they're going to do it because they can because they can each be in their living room um yeah so I'm just I'm really proud of Adrian for what he's accomplished and now he's moving into the teaching domain so he's developed something called sync space teach that allows people to to teach again with very low latency it's not quite the low latency that you'd get in the platform sync space platform there is in this in this teaching thing there is still a little bit of latency but I was with someone the other day and we sang happy birthday together and it was like you couldn't tell that there was any latency so I'm pretty excited about it for my teaching purposes I'm organizing a ukulele jazz festival in uh, May it's going to be a two-day festival and I'm hoping that I can use his teaching platform for portions of the event because um, it's got a really fun interface that allows you to hang out together in social spaces and you can get like a little virtual drink mm -hmm. <laughs> and stuff it's just way more fun than zoom or anything like that so yeah it's uh it's really cool i i'm very excited to see and interested to see what happens like when we finally get out of this pandemic where is the balance between virtual and um and um in person going to land yeah. because I, I don't know about you but I I have found that from a teaching perspective there's a lot that I love about teaching over the internet um I I have a setup at home which is my like this is my teaching studio that I'm in right now and I have like a little switcher where I have a second camera and I'll show you what I mean by that it's like I can switch to this mm -hmm. and that just shows like a magnified version of my left hand so when I'm doing courting I can show people and then switch back to like you know like a main view and I love being able to do that because when you're teaching you know if you're teaching like a larger group of students whoever is sitting in the front row gets the best view and then the person mm -hmm. who's stuck at the back is struggling to see like what's she doing was that the third or the fourth fret what did she just do you know whereas here everybody gets that same view and uh and so i'm uh, but i do i miss the chemistry and the joy of making music in the same room with people obviously so but i feel like internet is never going to go away now this internet teaching i feel like it's sort of do you think that it's been a, a seismic shift? Yeah, I definitely think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've worked with students all over the world, and I still have my core students in Ottawa that come to my house in masks, but then it's a different kind of, yeah, it's a very different, and it allows for, you know, we were talking about climate change before. It allows for a lot of exchange internationally, which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And plus, imagine, like, you don't have to park your car anywhere or go out in the snow or... Yeah. <laughs> Now you're yeah. holding this beautiful ukulele oh, this whole time. Yes. Would you play something else for us? Oh, absolutely. I would be <laughs> delighted to. Well, since you mentioned Bossa Nova, maybe I would do um, an, a Bossa Nova that, um, that uh, I wrote. It's called, um, it's, it's in French. Is that okay if I sing something in French? Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oui, okay. Um, so this is also from that album, Kiss Me Like That. This is a song called Le Tournesol. And um, I wrote it from the perspective of the sun who um, it's, it's kind of geeky, but I've always admired sunflowers, both because I think they're a beautiful flower, but I love the way that they track the sun. And I always think how much energy they expend, just like kind of like rotating and <laughs> facing the sun all the time. But, but I thought to myself, what if the sun took an interest in one of these sunflowers and fell in love with the sunflower? So this is a song sung by the sun to the sunflower. <laughs> it's called Le Tournesol, which means, um, Sunflower in French. Approche, je ne te ferai pas de mal. Offre-moi ta main, je t'emmènerai là où les cauchemars 
s'efface dans la nuit Loin de cette vie noyée sans cesse par la pluie Viens, ouvre doucement les yeux Sens-tu la chaleur de ma lumière À toi de suivre les traces de ma lueur Laisse mes rayons percer ton cœur Raconte-moi tes chagrins d'amour, tes larmes sécheront vite. Chez moi, tout s'évapore lorsque je sors. Alors, approche, je ne te ferai pas de mal. Offre-moi ta main, je t'emmènerai. Là où les cauchemars s'effacent dans la nuit Loin de cette vie noyée sans cesse par la pluie Viens, ouvre doucement les yeux Sens-tu la chaleur de ma lumière À toi de suivre les traces de ma lueur Laisse mes rayons percer ton cœur Pour que je t'échauffe de ma chaleur Laisse mes rayons percer Oh, wow. I think I have a new favorite song of yours. Oh, wow, thank great. you. <laughs> so you grew up in Montreal speaking, you know, Quebecois French, but your dad is Belgian. Is that right? Yes, yes. And um, yeah, interesting what you said about Quebecois French, because I would say that <laughs> I kind of, it was one of those situations where I grew up, my first exposure to French was at, at home and my dad has a Belgian accent or like a, a French accent uh, that's European anyway and um, the interesting thing was that I would go to school and I would get teased mm. uh, by the school kids because they said I was being a snob and I was speaking like a French person from France right and I was like I felt like Poirot you know Belgian madame Belgian <laughs> You know how Poirot, Hercule Poirot is always <laughs> like, I'm not French, I'm Belgian. But anyway, so yeah, I would get teased at school for that. And then I'd go, and then I would try to adapt and, and speak more Quebecois French. And then I'd come home and my dad would be like, why are you speaking like that? That's not your normal accent. <laughs> so I couldn't win, right? So I, I feel like um, I've, it's only as an adult that I kind of came into my own accent and kind of felt this is going to be this is what I am and it's somewhere mid-Atlantic probably <laughs> like it's not full-on Quebecois but it's not Belgian either it's somewhere in the middle and that's just it deal with it you know but until I was old enough to make that to affirm myself I had a very malleable accent so like mm -hmm. I could travel to Europe and kind of morph my accent into something completely different there and then completely different in Quebec so <laughs> But yeah, um, my dad, um, my dad is amazing because he um, immigrated to Canada and only spoke French and some Flemish as a second language, but didn't speak a word of English until he moved to Canada. And then not only did he end up sort of teaching himself English, but he became so good at his English that he uh, became a translator and was like an interpreter for, you know, the federal government for conferences and so he has this linguistic um, 
proficiency, I would say, and it's par partly due to his own natural talent, I'm sure. And also, he studied Latin and Greek in school, mm -hmm. and he taught, when he moved to Canada, he taught Latin and Greek and French in school. And so he has this very deep understanding of grammar and the commonalities of language. Um, and uh, you can give my dad a newspaper in almost any European language and he can, probably not Hungarian, <laughs> but <laughs> apart from that, he can sort of figure it out because he has this really solid rooting in these ancient languages and many modern languages too. Mm -hmm. So uh, he and I love to geek out. Um, when I was a kid, he would give me these long explanations about the etymology of words, you know, so it was never like, um, it was never a simple one word answer when I asked him what a word meant you know he would be like I'd be like uh, what is philosophy oh philo from love and Sof uh, Sophie from Sophia wisdom the love of wisdom so you know like I always got like the full breakdown of every word because of my dad's background and so I, I have become a bit of an etymology geek myself so I have this like the, I love dictionaries I have like I collect dictionaries and I will read through like especially etymology dictionaries I love learning about the roots of of language and English is so fascinating because you know we've got like the French but then there's the Saxon and then there's the German and so it's like this amazing melange of so many different influences so whenever you come across an English word it's always like oh what is the etymology of this one sometimes mm -hmm. I know it and sometimes I gotta look it up you know <laughs> yeah I'm, I have to say when I was a teenager I bought an etymology an etymology dictionary which I no longer have unfortunately but I used to read it for fun and I, I dabble in languages as a hobby I, I'm oh, really fascinated so cool. oh I'm so glad to meet a fellow etymology <laughs> geek that's awesome <laughs> and I'm curious you always perform usually in four languages and all your shows and albums but are there other languages you've studied I have I I studied <laughs> when I was uh, younger I fell in love with a German man and uh, I studied some German um, partly because of him, but also partly because um, I met a pianist in Oxford who wanted me to, he came to one of my concerts, it was a jazz concert, mind you, and he says to me, you want to get together and do Schubert Leader? I'm like, I said, holy cow, I said, you realize I'm not a classically trained singer, right? Like, I, you know, I'm not going to be like, Janet Baker or something you know I can't I can't sing that way <laughs> so so he said that, that's okay we're just gonna do it for fun and it was it was really um, be intimidating to me because I love classical repertoire I love leader I could listen to Schubert all day I could listen to Mahler all day like I cry when I hear Das Lied von der Herde you know like but um but I am used to phrasing songs how I want to you know so it was really hilarious because the first time I got together with this pianist I had I had done my homework I had listened to umpteenth number of different versions of the of you know the tunes that I knew we were going to be doing I can't remember it was like Di Fiorelle or whatever it was but um but we got together and he's he's accompanying me and he stops and he goes that was a dotted quarter note <laughs> like oh my god did I hold it too long I'm really really sorry I'm not used to caring about what's written on the page because <laughs> you know in jazz um the the lead sheet is just the starting point nobody sings if you sang a lead sheet in jazz as it was written on the page you'd sound so square like nobody would hire you again right but it was hilarious I was like oh my god I am in so I am so out of my comfort zone right now it's not even funny but anyway long story short I had a blast learning all these different leader um, we never performed them. We just jam jammed, like did mm -hmm. classical jams and stuff. But it was really hilarious. Like he made me up my game on sight reading, you know, <laughs> because I was like, I was not used to being held to account for every, <laughs> yeah. every quaver. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I had to, <clears throat> I had, by that point, I had done a year or two of German mm. classes, just, you know, twice a week or something. But I was motivated because I was in this relationship with a German speaker and, um, and so I was reading, he had given me some poetry by Heine Maria Rilke and people like that. And uh, I was reading, trying to read some Goethe. But, you know, I had these editions that have the German on one side and the English on the other so that I could cheat when I needed to. Um, but it, it was really helpful to to sing those. To, to I, I don't believe, 
I don't believe in singing in a language that I don't speak or understand mm -hmm. because I feel you have to be able to convey the emotion of the lyric and you have to understand deeply what you're singing about. And so you hear, I hear about people who learn songs phonetically and they're just singing in a language that they don't understand. I'm like, how do, they, how do you do that? I guess maybe you could if you have someone explain to you what every single syllable represents and what every single phrase means. But I, I don't feel right about it. I, and so, um, yeah, so that was why I wanted to make sure that I understood everything that I was going to sing, even if it was just for jamming purposes. So I do speak a wee bit of German. I've lost a lot of German because I haven't practiced it in a long time. And it's a very complicated language. I find the cases, it's just mm. like, oh my God, dative, accusative, genitive, nominative. Like by the time you've figured out what definite article you're supposed to use like <laughs> your train has left you know what I mean <laughs> so it's daunting um, but I also studied a bit of Italian and um, I don't remember much of it in terms like if you if I had to speak it on the spot I would probably start speaking some kind of mangled versions of Italian with Spanish and French mm. but where it's helpful is that as long as it's not being spoken too quickly I can understand almost everything that I hear in Italian but it's interesting because it's a bit binary because as mm. soon as things get beyond a certain speed, I understand nothing anymore. <laughs> like, so when, when people are speaking really quickly in Italian, it's like, nope, I cannot follow. But I can get by, like I can travel in Italy and be okay and, and just kind of people understand that I'm speaking some kind of mesh mash of romance languages mm -hmm. <laughs> in return. <laughs> so and, you was, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna ask, so you, um, when you went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, um, you had to turn down a recording contract. I did, I did. It's it's funny, in, in retrospect, it's funny that I agonized so much over that because it wasn't even a big label. It was an indie jazz label from Montreal that doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but I was so excited about this. I was, I was, um, I'd finished my undergrad degree I had been steadily doing more and more performing like I had reached in my final year of undergrad I think I was gigging like every single weekend Friday and Saturday nights and then I would be hard at work during the week studying physics and doing my homework and I would try to get all my homework done during the week so that my weekend was completely free to just do music and think about music and not be torn because I did feel at that time in my life I felt like I was really torn between the two things I was torn between my love of physics and my love of music and I felt like they couldn't coexist in my body almost. Like I, I had a really hard time. I would, I would love doing these gigs and, and, come, and I would come back home late on a Saturday night because I'd been performing till midnight, let's say, and then I had to eat and you have to kind of wind down, you know, after a gig. So I'd go to bed at like 2 a.m., wake up really late on a Sunday and I'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to go back to school on Monday. And my classes were always at 8.30 in the morning for whatever reason. So it was rough and I almost felt like, you know, in the old days how you had to reboot your hard drive, you could, I'm going to show my age right now, but you could boot it up in like, um, you know, like Windows or Unix or whatever. You had to sort of insert a different booting disk or whatever. But, um, but yeah, so I felt like that. It was like I had to reboot my brain into physics mode um, on a Monday and then come Friday afternoon, reboot into music mode. And I, I was wondering how I was going to continue. Like, how could these two tensions continue to exist inside me? And it felt like it all came to, like, a crunch when I won the scholarship and I was told, you have this amazing opportunity to go to Oxford to do your PhD, but you also have this recording contract in front of you, right? And that was something I'd always wanted to do. I always wanted to make a record. And um, thank goodness I got some very wise advice from a friend of mine, Andre White, who's a... a a jazz pianist from Montreal and a, a wonderful educator uh, from who teaches at McGill. He said to me, he said, you know, this isn't going to be your only recording opportunity. You can you can make a record any time in your life, but <laughs> the roads is only going to come around once, you know. Um, and until that point, I mean, I hadn't considered declining the roads or anything, but I had considered postponing it mm. asking I was thinking could I ask them if I could postpone it would that be the done thing will will they think I'm not serious enough about it and will they take it back away from me like would, would they withdraw the offer if I said I was thinking about postponing so all these things were going in my brain and then Andre said you know you don't you don't have to do this now you could make a record anytime and he also told me because I was very young at the time and he said your voice is going to change and mature as you get older and you might not even 
you might wish that you had waited, you know, like uh, to do a recording. And he was right on those on both counts. And the thing about that contract was it was a very controlling contract. They wanted to control who I was going to record with, what repertoire I would record. Mm. The contract also said that I had to go in when they wanted me to go in to the studio. And I said, I, I said, there should be a bit of give and take, right? They should be willing to be flexible and accommodate my needs. And we should have a mutually agreed upon time to go into the studio, for example. But they weren't really willing to bend at all on that. So that to me, that was a signal. It's like, these are, this is not going to work out. This is not what I want. And I'm glad that I waited because I ended up producing my own recording um, some years later. Um, I think um, about five years later, I did my first album. And uh, it was totally indie, <laughs> very modest pressing. I think I pressed like 500 CDs. Um, and but, but they all, I managed to sell them all at gigs and in, in this was in the UK. And so then I pressed another 500 and then sold those. And so, you know, it was like little, little steps like that. But uh, it was amazing. And I learned so much from having to produce. And to this day, I still love working that way. I love not just singing, but actually thinking about arrangements and thinking about how to sequence the songs. How do you make an album? Um, I mean, now I guess, I guess with streaming, the concept of albums doesn't really matter anymore. But in those days, I really paid a lot of attention and gave a lot of thought of how to sequence the songs. Mm so that I was varying things like tempos and keys and languages and, um, uh, you know, alternating between not putting, you know, you have to think about so many things. You don't want to put all your Latin tunes together or your boss. You have to, you have to spread them around. You have to make sure that it's not going to jolt people. It, it, there's just so many interesting things to think about when you're putting, putting mm. together, oops, putting together an album. And I remember sometimes I would, sequence songs like three or four different ways and then play them through and and see which one resonated the most with me and then that agonizing the most agonizing decision to me is always which song is the first one <laughs> which what should be the first song on the album so that I it's um compelling but also somewhat representative of what the rest of the project is going to be you know it's oh, there's so many variables it's like a puzzle it's really like putting it all together is such a puzzle um yeah it's uh, it's 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 amazing <laughs> but when you went to oxford you were able to sing you were able to still do music yes yes it um you know it took me a while to meet musicians um i've had to do that a few times in my life every time you move um it's like you're starting from scratch and this was this was before the um before i had my own website or anything like um, so I didn't really have any kind of like place where people could go and hear me. I had a demo. I had I had made a cassette <laughs> back in Montreal and I brought my demo with me. But, you know, to to um, I felt like I had left Montreal where people knew me, you know, and I'd had a little bit of exposure. I had done a, a couple of festivals, the, the Festival de Jazz International de Montréal, like the Montreal Jazz Fest had hired me and I had done this big outdoor concert and I was, you know, it, singing around the circuit and I knew that if I phoned musicians they'd be like yeah I'd love to do that with you because they knew me and they knew I was reliable and I could hold the tune and I knew when to come in and all those things that um, that musicians are always skeptical about when it comes to singers <laughs> you know um, but then you know you go to a new country and it's I didn't know anyone on the scene and then luckily I met a, f a friend of a friend connected me to a, pia a Canadian jazz pianist who was living in London and through him, I met a few musicians, and then I did the odd gig here or there. But um, it, it, it took a while. It just took a while to build up those connections. So I had a bit of a period of not doing anything for a couple of years and focusing very much on my studies and mm -hmm. focusing on my, my doctorate. And then um, I, I didn't meet any. There were no jazz musicians in Oxford that I connected with, um, and I didn't really... I went to a few quote unquote like jazz nights and they were like, uh, you know, like it, was, it was not really um, the speed I was used to in terms of like the caliber of the musicians mm -hmm. and all that. Maybe I just wasn't going to the right places, but I just didn't, I didn't see people that I felt I wanted to necessarily collaborate with at the time. But I, I did meet some salsa musicians and I got mm. into this salsa band. Um, and at the time, it was such a fun band to be in. It was a very mixed abilities band. There were professional musicians in the band, and there were also people who were just doing it for the love of it. 
Um, but what was so refreshing about that band was that I was in a university town where every single conversation with anybody you met always started the same way. You know, it was always like, so what's your thesis about? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, oh my God, I want to meet someone with a real life and a real job who's not stuck in their ivory tower, right? And so what I loved about that band is we had like, we had the bongo player, he was from Ecuador, he was a welder in the local, um, the BMW car factory that was mm. like a couple of, t like one town away. Um, we had a bassist who was a carpenter by trade. We had a saxophonist who was um, an, an, who worked at like an advertising agency and um, a trumpet player who was, you know, who worked for the local gas company, like as a salesman. So it was like people who were not from the academic world and I just found that so refreshing and it gave me a different perspective and to to play for audiences that are dancing mm -hmm. was a, quite a revelation to me because I was used to singing in jazz clubs where everybody sort of sits there like this and they're tapping their feet sometimes but they're rarely getting up and dancing whereas at a salsa gig everybody's dancing all the time and that's your purpose is to make them dance and to mm -hmm. have lively arrangements and recognizable tunes that people are going to be able to sing along with and so we were doing like tunes by Celia Cruz and Willy Colon and um, Oscar de Leon and you know, but just 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 really fun, bo bodacious arrangements. And um, boy, was it a, a hot! It got, gave me such a thrill to see people dancing to our music. It was mm -hmm. just the best. <laughs> it's interesting because at the beginning of this conversation, we talked about your early roots in dance and how that was connected with feeling the music in your body, and then you came to that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And and actually salsa dancing was I, I because I the reason I got into that band was I had also started to dance on the local salsa, like just getting part of the salsa scene. And that was because of my Brazilian housemate who mm -hmm. would take me out dancing all the time. She's like, come on, let's go dancing. Let's go dancing. So we would go dancing together and we would meet all these people. And that's how I met these people in the band. And they said they were looking for a singer who spoke Spanish. And I was like, I'm a singer who speaks Spanish. I could do that. <laughs> and um but you're right it was through the dance it's it was through my rediscovery of my love of dance this time through salsa dancing like partner mm -hmm. dancing that that it, it was so much fun um the thing i find hard about those styles of dancing though whether it's tango or salsa is the guy is always leading you know mm. as a woman you have to follow a guy's lead and i was like oh, oh why can't i lead sometimes <laughs> but that's not the done thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, and you're also at the mercy of whether that person has good rhythm or not because you you, you got to follow what they're doing, right? <laughs> so that's always interesting. When you brought up your ukulele, um, you said this is, I think you said it's a tenor or a baritone? It's a, it's a, tuned as a baritone. Mm -hmm. It's actually a slightly smaller scale than a typical baritone ukulele. Most baritone ukuleles are like 19 or 20 inches uh, in mm -hmm. the scale. This one is an 18 inch scale, but um, it's made by a wonderful luthier from right here in Canada. His name is Luis Feo de Mesquita, and he, um, he builds flamenco guitars and ukuleles. And he builds each ukulele with the same care he would put into like a beautiful guitar. And they just, they have this, the most beautiful, you know, like, like the tone is just oh to die for like after you play one of his ukuleles it's really hard to go back to one of those factory made ukuleles because yeah i love his instruments and i'm so lucky to have one of his instruments and he just he he has a background in engineering and he is uh, to me he's like the perfect marriage of of the science and the art because he he takes such care in his instruments and he understands the physics of what's going on in the instrument, you know, I, I think to me, that's the thing that, uh, you know, I always come back to is that so much of music production is about physics and waves, right? Um, and so I understanding, uh, understanding the basic physics of, you know, what's a harmonic? Why is it here? Why is it there? Why do I get this pitch when I press this there? You know, it's all, it's all physics. And so to have someone like him who understands the physics so innately, but also has this deep understanding of what each tone would is going to achieve, it's fascinating to talk to him. Like I, again, I can sort of geek out 
um, and Adrian's also a bit of a wood, a wood a tone wood geek as well. Mm -hmm. Adrian loves to do the research to be like, okay, so if we had a spruce, if we have like a Engelman spruce, it's going to be like this, but we could also do Adirondack spruce or bear claw spruce or da 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 da. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god. So it's it's really fun to sort of the the joy of consulting during the process of making a custom uke is to try to imagine what the uke is going to sound like based on sound samples that you're listening to and it's so i find it very hard it's it's still very much a leap of faith to decide like what should the back be so this instrument for example this is port orford cedar on the top and um you know what i love about it is like the top is from canada so it's port orford cedar from canada but the back and sides of the instrument they're made of koa which is a tree that grows in hawaii and so part of my instrument is from Hawaii, which is where the ukulele originates, and then part of it is from Canada, which is mm -hmm. where I come from. So I like that. <laughs> yeah, I understand it's definitely a Hawaii instrument, but it was um, inspired by Portuguese sailors who had brought small guitars. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And, and, and so they came over from Madeira, which was, um, um, a, they, they were um, laborers who were, um, some of them were agricultural workers. There was like a, f there was a, a, a f crop, some cr bad situations in Madeira at that time where they, they had some crop failures, like just difficult clima climatological situations where the, the agriculture just wasn't yielding what people were expecting. And so, and Hawaii, uh, at the time had a great need for foreign workers to come in to, you know, work the sugarcane fields and just, uh, you know, they needed external labor because their economy was was growing faster than they could have you know they didn't have enough people to work mm -hmm. and so some carpenters and cabinet makers and um were on this boat that that sailed from madeira to hawaii and apparently the so the story goes that when the, it was a long journey several i think uh, more than 100 days journey if i remember correctly on this boat called the raven's claw <laughs> that went over from madeira to um to hawaii and when they um they put into port and when the the portuguese immigrants got off the boat they were so happy that they brought out their little instruments and um yeah there's a couple of instruments um there's one called um rajan which is um and then there's um it, they're they're in a family of instruments called cavaquinho uh, which is uh, typically like a four stringed instrument which can either have metal strings or um, nylon strings, I think, depending on where, which part of the world it's, it ended up in. Um, but the cavaquinho is also a big part of Brazilian, of samba music. It's like mm -hmm. this tiny, um, the, the cavaquinho will have like metal strings, and so it has a very plucky sound because it's often like you're hearing, it's like way up here, this mm -hmm. octave sound, like it's. That's so sort of that sound, but of course I can't really reproduce it because I don't have the sort of steel strings mm -hmm. that you would normally have on like a high tension cavaquinho. But it's that sound that you're, we, we're all familiar with. If, we, if you like Brazilian music, you've heard that little tick 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 tick, and then you hear the cavaquinho also in music from like Cabo Verde. So if you hear Cesaria Evora or any of those wonderful uh, musicians from Cabo Verde, they've often got like a, a slower strum, but it'll be like. Like those same kind of sounds of up there, that little angels, sound, cavaquinho sound. And I think there was um, there was another instrument, and I'm kind of drawing a blank right now on its name. But the rajan had four strings. But then the other instrument, and I'm, I can't remember its name right now. But it was another. It was a five stringed instrument, but it had reentrant tuning. So it had like da, da you know, because you know this is a linear tuned uh, instrument. Goes so it goes. Do, do, do. But re-entrant tuning would be da, 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 da. And that's the classic ukulele sound from Hawaii, is that re-entrant uh, tuning. And so they merged together the tunings of kind of these two instruments. One, the five-stringer that had the re-entrant tuning, and then the four-string rajan. I might be getting mixed up. But they kind of merged the concepts together, where it was like a four-stringer, but with re-entrant tuning. And these cabinet makers, um, these early uh, Portuguese innovators who made this instrument, th this became the ukulele. And then the king, at the time, the king of Hawaii was trying to uh, ensure that Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian traditions 
were given a prominent place in the court and were elevated. And he was trying to sort of support the Hawaiian, his own culture, his Hawaiian culture. And so he he um, started using these new instruments, these ukuleles, to accompany. He was a, a good singer, and he had a group of singers that he had in his court who would perform. And they all started playing the ukulele, and he loved the ukulele. And I think it was thanks to his support of the instrument that it really flourished so it's 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 just such a lovely history it's even though it's a very recent history compared to other instruments i think it's it's got such a beautiful and unique history (laughs) a couple things i was curious about one of them is do you are you working on new songs or a new album oh that is um i'm not i have a ton of songs that i have never recorded that I want to still record and Mm -hmm. I'm also in the process of writing some new songs that have been percolating in my in the back of my mind but I feel kind of at at this point I'm a little bit at at a loss for how to proceed because I released um, Future Perfect the latest album in 2019 we did a release concert at the National Arts Center and I did a a release uh, show, a weekend show at the uh, at Upstairs Jazz Club in Montreal, mm. but there were plans for other concerts, and then the, and, and then 2020 pandemic hit, and everything stopped, and I was like, what do you do with a, a newly released album that you can't tour, and Sync Space hadn't been invented yet, and I couldn't perform with anybody, and I, it's just like, I don't know what to do anymore about this album. Like, is it old news? Can I start promoting it now? Is it too late? So I'm still kind of trying to figure out because we we're still not re- returning to live performing yet, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so it, it's just yeah. So I don't. I, I do. I have so much material. I would love to do another album, but I also feel like I haven't given this new album its um, its chance to kind of go out into the world properly. So I'm I I am still I feel like I still need to perform and tour these songs more before I think mm. about recording another album. Um but uh yeah it, it it's it's really interesting to, uh, to the the, so- the the songwriting process for these new songs has been very interesting because I I have found that during the pandemic it's not been I don't know I I hear about all these people who are like I've been so creative during the pandemic I've written a novel I've written an album (laughs) well for me it hasn't been that way I have not um it's almost like I feel like you have to be living your life to to feel the creative juices for Mm. that kind of creativity flowing that's not to say I don't feel like the last two years haven't been creative and productive they have because I've been doing I've been focusing a lot on teaching and just you know like just developing a whole bunch of new workshops and stuff so that that side of it has been very creative but it's almost like uh, I don't know it's it just it 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 hasn't I'm just I'm thankful that I have this stockpile of songs that Mm -hmm. are either finished or half finished so that I know that I can make a new album when the time comes but you would have thought that those half finished songs would have been worked on while I, while the pandemic was happening I, I, that would have been a good opportunity but <clears throat> the inspiration just wasn't there I, I yeah. don't know why that is but um but I guess n- you know not everybody reacts the same way to these situations where we're locked down <laughs> Probably because you knew that it was so uncertain as to when you could do them live. It probably just yeah. unconsciously stopped you. It's interesting, when I talked to Roddy, I can't remember exactly when we recorded it. I think it must have been the fall of 2020. So he'd been commissioned to write that album he did with Kelly Lee. Um, right. You know, about yeah. the pandemic. And he said he was having, not quite blocked, but really hard. He said just not being with people, it was just yeah. hard. He, he managed yeah. to come out with some amazing music, but I, I know it was a real struggle for him. But, you know, for me, like, one thing about this pandemic is just the, the, the true knowledge that anything can change so quickly. Life as you knew it can be so different. I think you should also make a new album if you have this material and <laughs> tour your, you know, when you get a chance. I love you, that album. I mean, oh, thank you. You need to do all the things, you know. All the things, do it all. You're, you know, yeah. you're right. I'm- you know, you are you were right. You're right in one respect, well, many respects. You're right in many respects, but in, but you're right in terms of the the life being fleeting aspect. I always think to myself, gosh, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, like I have all these songs that I have yet to even put to paper. Like mm-hmm. I'm I am one of these people who, um, for better or worse, when I hear a piece of music once, I remember it forever. 
and that can be both a good and a bad thing because sometimes you're like why am I remembering this tune right now it's not a good tune I don't want to remember this tune (laughs) but I do remember it right but um but what that means is like once I've written the lyrics for a tune down I often don't bother to write the music and the chords down because they're in my head wow um and I don't write it down until I need to which is not good because I'll be like, oh yeah, I've got that concert in a month's time and I'm going to premiere all these new songs. And then I'll be like, oh damn, I haven't written them down (laughs) anywhere. So then it's like, you know, like 10 nights in a row, five hours a night on Sibelius trying to get everything down all at once, right? Like just writing it all down super quickly just before the first rehearsal or something instead of writing it down properly like when you first get the ideas and that way it's all there and ready to go and it's not such a frantic scramble at the end so I don't know why again it's probably my in as I think back to that aversion that I used to have to reading music when I wanted to just do everything by ear when I was five I bet you it's the same inclination which is just like yeah I've got it up in my head I don't need to write it down until I suddenly need to write it down (laughs) you're like Mozart I'm really curious about this aspect so well (laughs) yeah but so then in terms of an improviser then do you remember everything you just improvised like you were just improvising for us did you oh, could you that's reproduce a good that question. no I don't think so um I I think I have to consciously that's a really good question you know I feel like I'm hearing myself differently when I'm thinking about improvising mm-hmm. so I'm not listening to my own improvising in the same way as if I was listening to somebody else does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I think it's because my brain is divided and I'm thinking about so many things. When you're improvising, it's like you're thinking about the chords, you're thinking about melodic ideas, you're thinking about rhythmic ideas, and and um, I, I'm not consciously thinking about all those things, but I think they're all kind of like going on in the back mm-hmm. of the mind, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. I've never thought about that. Like, do I remember my own scat solos? No, you know... I, I, I don't want to sound too flippant about the whole thing about I remember something if I hear it once. I remember, um, I think I remember, if there's if, if something is melodically strong, I will remember it, even if I've only heard it once. If something is just like, you know, like the fifth John Coltrane, the fifth take of a John Coltrane solo on a particular album or whatever with, with five alternate takes or whatever, am I going to remember each solo? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like a photograph I don't think it's like a photographic mm-hmm. melodic memory it's like if I choose to be if I choose to engage with a piece of music mm-hmm. actively and it is melodically memorable I will remember it like to the point where I get haunted by things like I remember there was this movie it was called Australia and um, it had Jeremy Irons in it and Fanny Ardan and it was set in the post-war post-world war II Belgium and I went to see it. I still remember I went to see it on this tiny screen. There used to be like a 21 Cineplex cinema in Montreal where they would show all these art house films. But the, the fact that the price you paid for that was that all the screens were really tiny, but it didn't matter. And it had this beautiful, beautiful, haunting score. And I only saw that film once, but it was so memorable that I, to this day, I still remember it. And I can't find the soundtrack to it anywhere because Mm -hmm. now, since then, there's been another movie made called Australia, which has um, Nicole Kidman in it. And I can't remember the name of the actor. Oh, Hugh Jackman, I think. So now if you look up the soundtrack to Australia, Mm -hmm. it's that one that comes up. And I could not find the soundtrack to that other movie. But um, um it's interesting because it has some very memorable intervals in it and I and I and I I find it I don't know it just I've never heard anything like that before Mm. and it haunts me and I can't find it anywhere so I I have to keep humming it to myself but I can't find the album anywhere (laughs) and you've written music for movies as well um, oh, well, I've written music that got used in ah, movies, okay. which is a bit different. So yeah. um, I wish I had written music bespoke for a movie. I would mm-hmm. love to do that. Um, no, what I, I did was I recorded a bunch of songs uh, with a wonderful British composer called Dick Walter. And he called us all into the studio in London for a week-long project. And um, at the last minute, 
he decided he, one of his songs needed French lyrics and he couldn't write them in French. So he had already hired me as a singer to sing all these orchestrated, you know, jazz. It, some of them were big bands. Some of them were more classically orchestrated pieces. And he said, Diane, can you write me some French lyrics for this tune? And I think I had like a week, <laughs> a week to come up with these lyrics. But you know how sometimes pressure, again, constraints, right? Constraints can be very... Um, and like they can be, trigger good things I feel like they can in, they, they, it forces sometimes having a deadline to work to is the best because you're just like okay I'm going to listen to this thing on repeat and wait until something presents itself and um, and I listened to his piece and I was like okay yeah I can hear it there's a nostalgia element to this and so I wrote lyrics that to me jived well with his melody and we recorded it and then he also asked me to write English lyrics to it I'm like uh, okay so I wrote an English version of that song and we recorded both versions of it and it got picked up and it got used in, a, a, I guess, a couple of places. But the one that I know of because I get so can royalties for it was it got used in this movie that Kate Blanchett um, ap appeared in. It was called Charlotte Grey. It's like a movie about um, a resistance, mm -hmm. um, a, wo a, a woman who um, starts working for the French resistance. And it's interesting, and it is appropriate that that piece would get used because it had that that style, like that World War II kind of style mm. to it. And then that, that piece also got used in uh, Maigret, uh, in an episode of Maigret Mysteries. And I didn't even know about it. It's only because my mom is a big fan of Maigret that she was like, I was watching TV the other day and I heard your song. I was like, what? <laughs> and then it's been used in like video games. And like, I can't believe what the life that this song has mm. had you know um and i only discover this after the fact when i get like so can royalties for it and so it's really interesting like um it's been a very interesting window into the world uh, into that world and then i wrote another an, an independent filmmaker from los angeles also asked to use my song while you're sleeping in a short film that she had produced mm. and so so that was kind of cool as well because um you know, she sent me like the rough cut to the scene where my song was going to get used. And it's just, it's so interesting because what you realize as a songwriter is your song has a certain meaning to you, but other people have their own interpretation of your lyrics and their experience and their interpretation of your song are just as valid as your own. Like I have no, I feel I, I don't want to, nor do I have the right to, tell other people what my song should mean to them right like it, it mm. to me that's that's so fascinating you, you put this thing out into the world and then it has a life of its own and it has a resonance of its own to people and um um it's interesting i remember um i was invited by a there was a professor of religious studies at mcgill university who used to teach a course it was called soul and soul music i think his name was norman cornett and he would invite different artists into his classroom and play songs for his students and then ask them to write essays about what the songs meant to them and he did this for me for some of my original tunes and he very kindly and, and then he interviewed me and we had a lovely conversation with him and his students and everything but then like a week later he really you know very kindly sent me some of the students uh, comments on what the songs meant to them and uh in particular one of my songs which was on my first album it's called after dusk that's there's a song which i wrote ca called after dusk i wrote the lyrics to it the, the music is by a dear friend of mine called mike rudd a wonderful jazz guitarist and wonderful composer um and that song to me like i wrote that song as almost like a form of therapy after a dear a good friend of mine a childhood friend of mine was killed by a um, hit and run driver when she mm. was out walking her dog and her husband was with her and he got a broken leg from the accident but he survived the accident and I was just like oh. and I had it this happened like a week after I had just returned to England from visiting my parents in Montreal and she died and the funeral was too quick like it all happened too fast I couldn't get back in time mm -hmm. to attend and uh, I also couldn't like really afford it because I had just flown back from Montreal anyway so my way of processing all my grief was to write this song from the kind of like the perspective of her husband who's kind of trying to come to terms with the passing um, but I kept it vague obviously like there was no reference to like death or anything in the song 
but to me I know exactly what that song is about and because it's about such a heavy subject I often have great difficulty performing it live mm -hmm. because I get all choked up and uh, and I can't kind of my chest gets tight and I get emotional and I can't actually sing the lyrics out without tightening everything um, and what was interesting was these students had listened to the song but I had not been there and I hadn't talked about what the song meant and their interpretation of it was totally different like they were hearing something they were hearing a general theme of separation and loss but it was about a breakup or it was about a parent leaving a child or something like it was so interesting to see what it meant to mm. them and it made me realize that I was doing the audience a disservice by explaining too much about the songs mm. like if I tell them what the song is about beforehand I've cu I've shut down their ability to create their own narrative for the song do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and and um yeah that was very eye-opening to me and I realized it's, a, it's better to have a bit of mystery and not explain too much about each song <laughs> yeah that, that's very very insightful well it's so much food for thought this has been an amazing conversation I, oh, I thank you so much thank you Lee. thank you Leah it's it's just um it's been a delight to talk to you I feel like I I feel like I've known you for a long time even though we've just met you're so delightful to talk to and um I, I thank you so much for having me on as, as your guest it's just been a delight season one of this podcast had 20 episodes and season two continues with a really interesting mix of musicians talking about their lives and careers with perspectives on overcoming challenges finding inspiration and connection through a life so enriched with music please follow this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about each new episode